Welcome everyone. Give us just a moment, please, to give time for other people to, to get online. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Jim Barbrack, and I will be your moderator for this webinar. I am co-director of the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University, or CSU as it's called, and one of the lead organizers of this webinar series, along with my co-director, Ryan Fincham, our program manager, Aaron Hicks, and our colleagues at the United States Forest Service International Programs, particularly the staff of the Brazil program of the Forest Service, including Jaylene Vera, Suleni Cotto, and Lorena Brewster. I see we have a good number of people online, so we're going to begin. The Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University and the US Forest Service International Programs are happy to be offering this webinar as part of our continued collaboration on protected area management. We jointly organize several training seminars each year in the United States uh, in English and Spanish on protected area management, tourism in protected areas and women's leadership in conservation. Plus a number of collaborative activities on the ground each year in Latin America, including in Brazil. Brazil is one of the countries we, we have worked together for many years together with you other US and Brazilian universities as junior partners with the United States Agency for International Development, the United States Forest Service, and Brazilian partners, particularly the Brazilian Ministry of the Environment and its Protected Area Management Agency, ICMIBIO, on issues such as capacity building and technical assistance to strengthen Brazil's large and diverse protected area system. The past 18 months of the pandemic have reduced our ability to work together on the ground with our local partners in Brazil, but we have continued to try to make good use of technology to build on our past activities and offer learning opportunities online. This webinar is an example of such efforts to continue to provide a virtual space for us to connect and learn. In addition, we hope to use this conversation to help inspire us all to ensure that our protected areas are better conserved, that managers are better equipped to lead, and that our protected areas better serve all people. I see that we're starting to get quite a few people joining us for this webinar. Thank you for being and joining us. As you might have heard in a message at the beginning, we are recording this webinar to, so that it can be broadcast later for those that cannot watch live. Uh, as you log in, please, we ask that you use the chat function to let us know where you are listening from. And please also pay attention to the chat room because we're going to be posting links to a number of documents mentioned by our speakers during the next 90 minutes. Before starting, please note that though I am speaking in English, we have simultaneous translation available for the entire webinar in Portuguese. There is a tab called interpretation. It looks like a little globe, okay, at the bottom of your screen. When you click on that tab, you can then choose which language you would like to use for this webinar. Once you choose a language and it should be your mother tongue, please stay in that language throughout the entire webinar. Now I'm gonna say this in Portuguese just once. This is the only Portuguese I'm going to say. Antes de começarmos, observem que embora eu esteja falando em inglês, temos tradução Before simultânea. Before we begin, although I am speaking in English, we have simultaneous webinar. translation available. Throughout the webinar, check the little globe the underneath. It's called interpretation at the lower end, at the right. Push the globe, clicking on it, and then you pick the language you want to hear. And then after that, you will be able to choose unmute original audio or actually mute original audio so that you don't hear both the translation and presentation at the same time so you should mute original audio now back to english and sorry for that just to make sure everyone knows how to use the interpretation function as we get started with our panelists if you have questions for them 
we would like to ask that you use the question and answer function, not the chat room, the question and answer function, Q&A, at the bottom of the Zoom page for all questions to panelists. Note that this session is being recorded and we will provide a link to the recorded session on our webpage. Our colleague Lorena Brewster of the US Forest Service will be monitoring the questions and will help organize them. And she will then ask a few of these questions to our panelists toward the ends of the session today. Ryan Finchin and Aaron Hicks of CSU and Suleni Koto of the Forest Service are providing technical support. So if you have any questions or any issues, please reach out to them through the chat function if something is not working properly. And I would note we're going to keep the session to 90 minutes in length. In our webinar today, we're first going to have two speakers that work for the US Forest Service talk to us about concessions and other forms of partnerships that the US Forest Service uses on its 155 national forest and 20 national grasslands, which together receive over 200 million visitors a year. Then we will have two Brazilian speakers who will reflect on the relevance of the presentations and experience in US for Brazil and the potential application of lessons learned from the United States experience in Brazil, as Brazil rapidly expands the use of different types of novel governance arrangements and public-private partnerships to manage federal, state, local government, and private protected areas as visitation to them in Brazil continues to rapidly increase. I am now going to present our four panelists and then give each of them a few minutes to provide us a brief overview of the work. Ben Johnson serves as the team lead for the Forest Service National Recreation Special Uses Program. In this role, he provides oversight and coordination to policies regarding permits and provides support to national forests around the country. Prior to this role, he worked for the Forest Service Enterprise Program, the Coronado National Forest, and the Arapaho and Roosevelt National Forest right here in Colorado, where I am. Before joining the Forest Service, Ben attended Southwestern University for his undergraduate degree and then did his graduate study at the University of Michigan in the School of Environment and Sustainability and the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. Ben has worked as a professional climbing and canyoneering guide in North Carolina, Texas, Minnesota, and Utah. So he's been on the other side too as a, a, a basically a concessionaire or guide for uh, on public lands. Ben currently lives in Bellingham, Washington. He will be talking to us about the national program of the Forest Service related to concessions and other types of public-private partnerships used by the Forest Service to manage public use, tourism, and recreation across the forest system. Anne Schwaller is currently the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness Program Manager on the Superior National Forest in Minnesota on our northern border with Canada. She began her career in resource conservation working in a wilderness area in Washington state as a volunteer, like many of us began in 1992, and then worked for the Forest Service in wilderness areas in Colorado, Montana, and Idaho. She also worked for the US National Park Service in Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. Her jobs have included wilderness ranger, trail crew member, firefighter, visitor center manager, and wilderness recreation planner. She received her bachelor's degree in photojournalism with a minor in forest resources and conservation from the University of Florida, and a master's degree in recreation management from the University of Montana. Anne grew up on a wild and scenic river next to a state park in Southeast Florida, where she spent much time on the river, in the woods, and in the ocean. Anne loves to travel and to hike the Superior Trail, kayak on Lake Superior, and paddle in the Boundary Waters, Waters Apostles Islands, and Voyagers National Park. Our third speaker will be Fernando Pieroni. Fernando is the CEO of the Samea Institute, a nonprofit organization based in Sao Paulo that provides public-private partnerships that promotes, excuse me, public-private partnerships and other tools to expand opportunities for Brazilians to visit and enjoy all types of protected areas. He previously was the director of public-private partnerships, uh, the public-private partnerships unit for the city of Sao Paulo and also of the Brazilian project structurer, which was a joint venture 
of the Brazil National Development Bank and other financial institutions that developed over 15 major infrastructure projects in Brazil. He also uh, used to work as the responsible person for the Economic and Regulatory Affairs Unit for the Ascende Brazil Institute, and he was a consultant at A.T. Kearney. He has his uh, undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from the State University of Campinas, Sao Paulo, and he has a master's degree in economics and energy policy from the University of Sao Paulo. He also completed a specialization in infrastructure and public-private partnerships for the, from the executive education program at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Our final speaker will be Sibeli Munoz Amato. Sibeli is a forest engineer with a master's degree in ecology and conservation from the Federal University of Paraná. She has worked with Protect Area since 1997 and after working in the nonprofit and private sector has worked in public administration at the Chico Mendes Institute for Biodiversity Conservation, the Brazilian Federal Protected Areas Agency. She has been head of the Super National Park, the Asungi National Forest and the Guaricana National Park. Before assuming her current role as head of Iguazu National Park, the second most visited national park in Brazil and a World Heritage Site, she was responsible for managing public use at that same park. So we're first going to ask our two US Forest Service speakers to talk about their work related to the topic of tourism concessions and other types of partnerships with private uh, sector partners. Ben will first give a PowerPoint presentation on his work at the national level, then Anne will give a presentation on her work at a specific national forest in the state of Minnesota on the Canadian border. After that, we will immediately follow up with comments and reflections from Fernando and Sibeli about the two presentations from our Forest Service colleagues and how the United States experience compares to their work and current trends in Brazil on this same subject. So I'm now going to turn to Ben. Uh, ben, if you want to uh, tell us what you're working on these days and then go right into your uh, presentation. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Jim, and thank you everyone who's joined us today. I'm going to go ahead and pull up my shared screen. So give me a moment. And hopefully that is traveling through the internet and folks can see it. Um, so again, as Jim stated, my name is Ben Johnson, and I am the National Recreation Special Uses Program Manager out of our headquarters uh, for the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, I'm currently stationed on the West Coast, so still good morning to all of my colleagues in Brazil who I know are, are ending your days. Uh, before I jump into it, just want to say too, I like many of us, I am uh, I'm working from home right now. So if you do happen to hear, uh, let's say, a dog walk in or something like that, uh, my apologies or try to get into a, a quiet space. Um, as Jim mentioned, I kind of want to start off the presentation or the series of, of speakers here. Uh, kind of providing a higher level look at our recreation concessions program. Um, oftentimes we call it the special uses program uh, and provide a little bit of history, um, a little bit of our viewpoint on uh, the benefits provided by this sort of program. And then also talk about the types of concessions that we offer uh, in, in partners that we work with on our national forests. Um, obviously we'll then get into a little bit more detail with Anne's presentation. And I am, oh, there we go, skipping ahead too much. Um, so first off, just want to start off with a, a definition of a concessionaire, at least from our point of view. Um, so this is a private business or nonprofit third party entity that is authorized to operate commercial services on uh, national forest system lands. Um, so it's a pretty wide definition. It's everything from large corporations to small uh, businesses to uh, nonprofits that are working to get youth uh, and other groups outside on our national forest system or national forests. Um, and there's some beauty in that it's a wide definition because it means we get to meet or we get to work with uh, many different types of partners that all bring their own set of skills and expertise and specialization um, to the services they provide on national forests. Now, our work with uh, commercial recreation service providers or concessionaires has a pretty long history in the agency and on national forests, um, even going back before the US Forest Service was created. Um, so as you can see in this slide, starting in 1897, um, we got authority to start issuing permits for things like hot springs and um, 
1950 for other things like hotels, resorts, summer camps. Um, and you'll see a trend here is uh, we actually, um, in order to issue our permits or to issue our, our contracts with our concessionaires, we typically have to have um, some explicit law that is passed by uh, the US Congress that gives us the authority to do so. And as the agency has moved through the last 130 years, we've kind of gathered up additional authorities um, as each decade goes on. So we started very broad with things like hot springs. Uh, we then were able to issue permits for things like summer camps, hotels, resorts. In the 30s and 40s, uh, we started getting um, the authority to start creating ski areas with private entities, um, as well as then moving into campground operators, outfitters and guides. And, and now it's a, a very wide swath of activities that we authorize. And I'll get into that uh, in a little bit. But I think it's important to kind of see this history of our program. Um, it, it kind of um, highlights uh, the iterative nature of the concessionaire program and how uh, we've changed over time, um, which I think is an important thing when you're thinking about setting up a program on your protected unit uh, or area, um, because it, um, it needs to be nimble, it needs to be adaptable as all of the types of services that the public wants continues to change. So uh, because we're a federal agency, there is a certain amount of regulatory or legal structure for how we issue our permits. Um, and so basically all of the relationships that we get into with commercial recreation uh, providers uh, need to, of course, be in line with US law, regulation, and policy. Uh, additionally, they need to be in line with the local forest plan um, that exists for each of our national forests. So each of the 155 units that Jim mentioned in his intro have a specific plan that dictates decisions that are made at the local level. Um, you probably have something very similar or are working on something similar for areas that you work with or may be responsible for. And, and that's, a, that's an important thing because it kind of is the strategic plan for the types of activities that we authorize, whether it's a big development of a resort or um, or a campground, or it's the types of activities we allow on our trail systems, um, things of that nature. So that policy structure is important, and it kind of puts the, um, the boundaries on what we can and cannot do uh, as we try to work with different public-private ventures and partners to offer services to the public. Now, the agency uh, has really embraced our work with um, our, our concessionaires and our commercial providers. Um, because we see that there's a lot of benefit uh, to all parties involved. So obviously for the, uh, for the business or the entity that has a permit with the National Forest, um, there's uh, a, a benefit for them in the terms of financial revenues that they receive from uh, being able to conduct business on National Forests. Um, that's a pretty cut and dry one. Uh, but we also see plenty of benefits, some of which are captured, captured here, um, for the agency as well as the public and the visitor. Um, so the beauty of these relationships that we have is um, our concessionaires are able to provide services and experiences that us as a government agency um, maybe aren't, aren't best, best positioned to provide to those people. Um, and so for the public and visitor, the beauty is, um, you know, they can go out on a national forest and they can experience their favorite type of activity in a new place. Um, they can also go and experience a brand new activity, uh, maybe for the first time that has a high barrier to entry, like you need to buy certain equipment or you need expertise and a guide. And by having these commercial operators provide that service, it lowers that barrier, barrier of entry so our visitors and our public um, can go out and enjoy their public lands. Additionally, it allows them to learn more about the natural and cultural resources um, that exist on those national forests. So a lot of our um, concessionaires will actually incorporate um, different educational components. So it's not just about the recreational experience of camping or um, going rock climbing or going down a river, um, but our, our concessionaires are, are very, um, very good at making sure that there's an educational message around uh, the different resources, whether cultural or natural, that the visitor is experiencing. Additionally, it, it, working with these concessionaires allows us to um, provide the public and visitors with a different set of experiences that they 
that they may not be able to do themselves. So it's easy, it's perhaps easy to bring a tent and go camping. Um, but if you want to have the experience of renting a um, cabin in the woods or an old fire lookout or something like that, um, working with concessionaires allows us to provide those experiences, which um, are becoming more and more popular in the US and, and I presume everywhere as we see um, sort of the changing mindset of our visitors to our national forests. It's not, not just camping, it's I want to stay in a tent or I want to go on a sort of a safari like experience or I want to have um, not something that's as rustic as maybe we used to offer in the past. They want a more refined or uh, upscale experience of staying in a nicer hotel or a resort. And going into these partnerships with our concessionaires allows um, the agency to provide that experience through our partners. Additionally, for the agency and the government, I, I highlighted a couple of these, but there are plenty of benefits for us as well. Um, obviously, it allows us to provide a diverse um, selection or array of recreational opportunities for the public. Um, it also allows us to have those um, opportunities be of a very high quality. Um, you know, a forest service employee is not necessarily best positioned to provide uh, a wonderful uh, whitewater rafting experience, uh, but we can do that through our, our partners and our concessionaires. Um, and definitely, and additionally, it allows um, sort of a, a distinct local economic benefit. So a lot of these uh, concessions that we work with are based in the communities around our national forests. And so they pay local taxes. Um, they help build up the tourism industry in the cities and towns around our national forests. And we see that as an agency, we see that as a benefit um, to helping support those local communities and rural communities that live uh, on and near our national forests. Um, Additionally, uh, sort of more specific to the agency, um, these relationships also are fee generate or revenue generating for our national forests. So we rely on um, many of the fees that come from these permits and these relationships with our concessions to do things like facility maintenance, um, to hire staff, uh, to provide educational opportunities, um, and to share conservation messages. And so that's a that's a huge benefit for us not just the financial side, but just the ability um, to use our partners to really educate our visitors, uh, manage visitor use issues. Uh, you know, we can dictate where these people, where these concessions operate uh, and things along that nature, along those lines. Uh, one of the more exciting things that we've been doing recently as well is really viewing our relationships with our concessionaires as a way to steward uh, the natural landscape that they're working in. Um, so we've developed options for, um, for example, our outfitters and guides to, uh, in lieu of paying fees to the government, so get, instead of giving us money, they can do stewardship projects. So they can maintain trails, they can maintain campsites, um, help us with our maintenance um, issues uh, instead of paying us fees. So it's a very mutually beneficial relationship and, and one that we really enjoy and appreciate. Um, so those are some of the benefits. And so kind of at a high level, um, to provide a little bit more context, I want to talk about the types of concessions that we offer on national forests. Um, so each of our concessions has a permit. And so for our recreation permits, we have approximately at any given time about 35 to 38,000 active permits uh, working across the, the United States. So that's a, that's a lot of individual businesses and nonprofits that are have an active and engaged relationship with their local national forests uh, and, and that rely on these uh, permits uh, in order to um, you know, really be successful. And they can kind of be, all of those thousands of permits, all those relationships with concessions can be broken down into a couple of categories. One, it's privately owned infrastructure. Two, government owned facilities. And then three, just the temporary use of government owned uh, facilities such as trails. Um, let's skip the slide. So when we talk about privately owned infrastructure, uh, this is things like resorts. Uh, it includes our ski areas, which um, is one of probably our kind of our highest development level of concession operations that we have. 
additionally, it can include things like uh, rental cabins that people may have built, um, hut systems for multi-day ski tours or mountain bike tours. Um, when it comes to government owned facilities, this can also include resorts. Uh, so we have a number of historic uh, resorts that have been built long ago on national forests and we uh, let concessions operate those for us. It can also include our campgrounds. We have a very robust um, campground program where private businesses actually operate those campgrounds for us and they uh, maintain the campgrounds and invest into, in those campgrounds in a way that we wouldn't be able to do with our appropriated dollars. And then probably the biggest program, because it includes outfitters and guides, is the temporary use of government facilities. Um, so this is authorizing our concessions to use trails for running events, um, backpacking, rock climbing, mountain biking. Uh, the new big thing is e-bikes or, e or electric bicycles. Um, and so we have uh, many different operators working on all national forests providing that sort of uh, opportunity. Now, a couple of key learnings that we've tried to, to tease through over the years, and, and we're, always, we're always learning, we're always trying to update our policies to, to meet the current need, um, but we've really tried to focus on contract term links that match the level of investment of our concession operator um, so that it's a good investment for them, right? So we need to give them enough time that they're able to make back the money that they invest in the infrastructure or the business that they're, they're operating on national forest system lands. Um, so that's um, an important piece. Uh, addition additionally, um, all recreation concessions are managed in partnership with the agency. So um, there are uh, kind of strict guidelines made at the local level of what our concessions can and cannot do, how they need to operate their business. And this is primarily so that um, we're protecting the natural and cultural resources that they're operating within because um, that is one of our mandates of our agency. Um, so trying to kind of meet that equilibrium that they're able to go forward and, and, and have a successful business while also um, protecting the environment, protecting cultural resources that exist. A key thing too with all of our recreation concessions is really um, having clearly established roles between the agency and our concession in terms of our relationship. So clear points of contact for everyone, um, and open lines of communication. And that is something that over time we struggle with and we succeed with, um, but it's something that we really find to be one of the most important parts of having a successful relationship with the concession uh, is having that um, strong relationship on the ground, uh, which I think is something that Anne can speak to. Um, kind of in summary, so that we can make sure we get to all of our presenters, um, I did just highlight that um, although we've been Implementing this program with concessions for a, you know, going on over a hundred years, um, we're always learning, and so we are um, deep in the middle of a sort of modernization effort for our program, um, trying to learn from the past hundred years of how we can uh, improve it, uh, make our processes more efficient and streamlined to really um, get more of these recreation concessions operating on national forest system lands. Um, additionally. Uh, one of the things that we're we're really struggling with, and, and perhaps y'all are too, is the ever increasing um, changes in how people want to recreate on public lands. Um, so it may have just used to be hiking or bird watching, um, but now there's all sorts of different ways people like to play outside. And so um, that's one thing that we're trying to to work through is how we uh, continue to respond to that ever changing suite of services that our concessions want to offer uh, to the public um, because it is ever changing. And, and one of the things we've seen um, over the last 18 months with the COVID pandemic is people love going outside over the 18 months, the past 18 months. It was a safe place to be. Uh, and it was a place where they could go out and, and, and be with their families uh, in a safe way. And so um, we see a lot of increased use and we're trying to um, make sure we're adapting to that as it continues over the next few years. Um, I think with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and end the presentation and hand it over to Jim and look forward to Q&As uh, at the end. Thank you very much, Ben. And now I would like to turn to Anne 
and uh, it's going to be your turn. So can you tell us about how your work with Outfitter Guides, resorts, and other nonprofit cooperators and for-profit cooperators on the Superior National Forest helps provide high quality visitor experiences in designated wilderness areas while protecting physical and social resources of your national forest. Mm -hmm. Can you see my presentation? Awesome, and you can hear me, great. Um, yeah, this is an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Really quick for an outline, I'm um, gonna talk about the forest in general, uh, the Boundary Waters Community Wilderness where most of our outfitting and guiding takes place, um, the recreational services that we offer, uh, partnerships and facilitation tools, um, and then maintenance of partnerships. Um, but I'm gonna talk about a very specific location where all of these things take place that Ben just talked about. Um, and I'm also gonna expand the partnership concept beyond recreation because so many of our partnerships overlap and intersect, um, which is an interesting part of it for sure. So um, to orient you, hopefully you can see my cursor. Uh, if you look up in this little red blotch up there, I'm in Northeastern Minnesota um, and for the rest of this map, all of this white part at the top is Canada. And then all of the green is the Superior National Forest. Um, the dark green is the wilderness area. Um, over here in the, the, on the west end, the pink is Voyager National Park, and that's recommended wilderness. All of this yellow up north here is uh, Aquatico Provincial Park. Um, and then La Vrandre Provincial Park runs along the border. Um, this whole thing is the border. Um, and then there's a Grand Portage National Monument here on the east end. And then sprinkled throughout are the state of Minnesota forests and parks. Um, a lot of their parks are along the shore here. This is Lake Superior. Um, we've got local government county lands sprinkled throughout, um, private inholdings on the forest in the wilderness. Um, and then of course, all the gateway communities um, that are sprinkled throughout. Um, as gateways for these recreational opportunities. So here are the, the main opportunities that you will find. Um, I've underlined some of the most popular ones and um, all of these include outfitting and guiding of some sort authorized by the forest. Um, fishing is a big thing here. Um, it's the thread of all of our activities almost, it's amazing. Um, as an aside, uh, the National Visitor Use Monitoring Report in 2016 showed about 890,000 uh, visits to the forest. So um, yeah, so now I'm just gonna focus on the wilderness portion of the forest. And again, that's the dark green up here, oops. And um, again, I'm focusing on this because that's where a lot of this outfitting and guiding takes place. Um, all of the forest is protected in different ways for different uses, but the wilderness is considered the most protected area. Um, it was established in 1964 and it has subsequent legislation in 78. Um, and a lot of that guides our outfitting and, and guiding um, principles and what they can and can't do in wilderness. And it, the wilderness extends um, nearly 241 kilometers along the international boundary. Um, the, the Boundary Waters itself is 444,000 hectares, and we have about 2,000 designated campsites. They have latrines and fire grates and primitive tent pads. Um, outside wilderness, we have developed campgrounds for car camping. Um, we have primitive campsites and then dispersed camping with no facilities. And these are on the rest of the green area, the lighter green area, but they all border um, the wilderness. Um, oh, one more thing. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, because the, the outfitters and guides are weaved into the complexity here, but I wanted to talk about the wilderness as being really one of the most heavily used areas in the nation. Um, the, the complexity and management due to the high visitation, 
the number of cooperators out there's guides and resources that we have all surrounding it, um, the number of entry points and the quota system, the designated campsites, um, the activities along the international border with, with our border patrol and their border patrol. Um, we have a 1,219 meter airspace reservation. Um, we have hundreds of prehistoric and historic heritage sites that are co-mingled with our campsites. Um, so considering that with campsite manage it, management is difficult. Um, we have frequent litigation over our management here. Um, we have a lot of private inholdings and even uh, threatened or endangered species. We have specific biological areas spread throughout. Um, it's a complex system and the size alone makes it difficult sometimes. Um, I just wanted to briefly say um, that permits are required for all visitors um, to the wilderness and it's based on the type of use and the time of year. Um, we are also under a national contract with recreation.gov where wilderness visitors reserve their quota permits. And this is also where people reserve their campground um, reservations as well outside of wilderness. And our outfitters and guides and resorts and cooperators also use um, rec.gov for their clients. Um, and here's some of the actual services, special uses, outfitter guides um, that we offer here. Um, they're currently under special use permit. And not all of these occur in designated wilderness, but they occur forest wide. Um, there are a couple terms that I thought I'd um, mention or clarify. We have tow boats, and so you think of it as a, as a water taxi for canoes. Um, for a fee, outfitters will stack canoes on top of racks on top of their motor boats to move visitors into the interior faster, and that's authorized by law. We also have interesting portage operations. Um, in certain motorized lakes, there are land bridges between the lakes, um, and so these mechanical portages will pull your motor boat overland to get your boat and gear to the other lake. These are also authorized by law. Um, one is a contract with one of our outfitters and the other is an agreement with the state of Minnesota. I'm just trying to show the ties between everyone. Um, and then we have recreation residences. Um, those are federal land uh, that's been leased to the public to build cabins many years ago as a way to entice forest visitation. Um, another interesting one is the Chickwalk Museum. That's right on the edge of the wilderness, and it's a joint venture with um, the Gunflet Trail Historical Society and also an outfitter and guide um, uh, organization. Basically interprets the story of the area. Um, in one way or another, all of these are extremely critical partnerships because they often overlap, certainly with management, um, but also with the forest visitors that use one or more of these services on the same trip. Um, so the types of partnerships, we have government to government. Um, we work at the state of Minnesota. Um, sometimes we have slightly different missions. So um, we have a memorandum of understanding with the state on joint management. Uh, for example, fisheries such as stocking, survey, and spawn tape. Also with wildlife, can be trapping and collaring animals for research, like moose. Um, but our outfitters and guides actually assist with a lot of that. Um, we have meetings twice a year with the state to discuss these operations as well. Um, we partner on law enforcement issues, um, all kinds of things, non-native invasive species, a variety of things. Another, park, another uh, partnership is the, with the Park Service and the National Monuments. Um, we work on joint visitor management issues together. We, we share a lot of the same outfitters and guides. So um, our special use permits are somewhat translated into a different kind of inst instrument um, with the park service. Um, and we work with them a lot. Uh, like for instance, if a border area is getting crowded or receiving physical resource damage, we can pull field resources and, and work on the area together and, and um, work with the outfitters and guides to talk about what their um, contribution might be. Um, and the same with the Canadian provincial parks. Um, it's the same type of benefits. Um, 
we work on portages uh, along the border and uh, that helps to you know, um, get to places that we wouldn't normally be able to get to because our, our wilderness rangers meet theirs in the middle of nowhere on the border. So it's, it's a good deal. Um, we work with First Nations. The, the entire forest, including the wilderness, is a treaty area um, based on 1854 treaty authority. So there's intertribal natural resource management folks that work to protect and implement off reservation hunting, fishing, and gathering rights on the Superior National Forest. Um, we have government to government consultations more often um, than not on operations. And we just hired a new tribal liaison. Um, and First Nation also provides um, guides. Um, we work with internal Forest Service research stations and universities, um, which we also weave uh, outfitters and guides into a lot of those conversations. Um, we collaborate on research projects across the forest. Um, yeah, so um, I threw Nature Conservancy in here and others like them because we have so many other natural resource partnerships um, that focus on issues or research surrounding recreation, guiding, climate change, fisheries, wildlife, air, and water quality, just everything you could possibly think of. We have a group that's interested in that. And a lot of times we bring our partners in, um, outfitters and guides and resorts in to help with that. Um, so getting to some of the local businesses, um, so each gateway community has businesses that can pretty much outfit any type of outdoor trip you'd like. Um, the backcountry guides are under special use permit. Um, these same businesses may also hold um, a variety of other agreements with us. So again, it all weaves in together. Um, some businesses offer their guest naturalist programs in, in collaboration with our staff. Um, the resorts on the edge of the forest can do sometimes all, all these things. They may outfit, they may guide, um, they can issue boundary waters permits, they have naturalist programs, um, some of them do it all. Um, and then our developed campgrounds, like I was saying before, are scattered throughout. Um, and those are concessionaire contracts with companies that run the day-to-day -day operations. Um, for those not under contract, it might be an agreement with um, an outfitter, or it could be an agreement with a university. It just depends on the year. Um, and then advocacy groups and other conservation groups. Um, I've listed a few here, um, and they have very different roles. But again, um, a lot of their roles do intersect with other partners. Um, some are advocates at times, some are litigants, but um, we learn from that. Other groups um, help with specific field projects like trail and campsite management, monitoring, visitor education, recruiting volunteers, grant writing. Um, and again, I mentioned all of these types of partnerships because they can all be working with us on the same issues, but from very different perspectives or for its needs. Um, so I, I know I keep saying this, but they really all do end up um, intersecting. So some of the facilitation tools, and I'm sure you are aware of and use, but um, you know we have different grants for financial assistance and some of these groups will write them for us. Um, we have co cooperative agreements and these are collaborative projects with universities. Um, an example would be a field research and later publication used for, for management. Um, concessionaire contracts, um, again, it's, a legally binding document that um, supports certain work. So our campgrounds are um, concession contracts. So um, memorandum of understanding, um, we use this a lot for um, agreements with the state of Minnesota for our field operations um, in the forest. And non-disclosure non agreements, um, some of the examples for that include uh, working with different groups on sensitive issues like cultural resource sites or um, threatened or endangered animal project sites. So like wolf collaring. Um, 
and advocacy groups can help with the funding and guides help us with the field work sometimes. Um, I think the other ones you're probably very familiar with, uh, master agreements. Um, we use these for um, to contract services into the future. Um, so we can use a national master agreement for things like the Student Conservation Association or AmeriCorps. Um, and outfitters may outfit some of these groups when they go in the field um, or transport them. So they're always around for um, help with any kind of work that we're doing. Um, and I, I, without these partnerships dedicated to some of this field work, we, we would only get a fraction of our work completed every year. Um, as, as a great example, some of our NPOs recruit volunteers for us and we have wilderness rangers that pair up in a canoe to, co to cover wilderness routes for portage and campsite maintenance, education and law enforcement. So often we can pair a ranger with a seasoned volunteer so they, the official coverage is effectively doubled. So having these folks um, allows us to cover so much more ground during the field season. Um, excuse me. So I wanted to talk about two really unique alliances. Um, the first one is um, our Boundary Waters Canary Wilderness Cooperator Program. It's um, an agreement that we created to fill a particular niche. Um, there are about 60 local businesses that are spread across the forest in these gateway communities. Um, and they help the Forest Service issue wilderness permits. Um, they may own, they, they can also um, make wilderness permit reservations for their clients um, only in their client's name. But part of that issuance includes leave no trace or tread lightly education, um, re any recent alerts like bears or fire closures. Um, we have five cooperator administrators on the forest that meet with these cooperators in the spring and the fall to discuss upcoming season um, or an after season review. Um, they troubleshoot the reservation system for the cooperators and review their performance. You know, and we, we think of things like, you know, did they give the education to every client? Did they keep up with the administrative part in the reservation system in their own files? You know, do they follow the business rules? So although this type of partnership is extremely time consuming, um, the public has 66 physical locations to get their permits instead of just six forest service offices. So it's, it's very convenient for visitors. Um, many of these businesses stay open much later than our offices, sometimes till 9 p.m. Um, so that really gives a visitor flexibility. Um, and also many of these visitors are, are renting gear from the cooperator or hiring a guide from them. So the permit issuance in the same location is of course very convenient and beneficial. Um, so we can better serve our visitors um, through this kind of partnership. Um, and many of these cooperators also manage developed campgrounds near their businesses. So there's a nice tie between developed rec and, rec and, and wilderness. Um, and we have a lot of the same standards for our backcountry guides um, that are also often cooperators. Um, are they following leave no trace principles? Are they bear aware? Are they giving wilderness education to their clients? So these are the kind of questions we ask of these kind of partners. Um, the second one I wanna talk about is Heart of the Continent Partnership. Um, the first element of it, we have a sister sites arrangement and it's a park service kind of agreement um, that acknowledges similarities between protected areas and promotes sharing of ideas and sometimes sharing of staff. Um, but this uh, sister sites arrangement through this Heart of the Continent Partnership organization is between the Superior National Forest Voyageurs National Park, Quetico Provincial Park, um, La Vrandre, Grand Portage National Monument, and the state of Minnesota. Um, and we collaborate on all kinds of joint management issues, but the interesting thing about this partnership um, is that there's three different branches. There's the land managers and the sister sites agreement I just mentioned. Um, there's researchers, um, but there's also all the local businesses and advocacy groups. Um, and we all, at certain times meet together. So it, it basically brings everyone to the table um, at different times for different events, but you have a, a extremely 
rich um, environment for cross-pollination. Um, and if there are any conflicts between any groups, um, it, it, you know, it's hard to stay mad at someone when you're you know, face-to-face -face talking about um, the difficulties in your job or your family or whatever, um, you, know, you see each other as people. And so it's really important to have the social elements. So when we do have these part of the continent partnerships and all these folks to come together, we've really been able to um, solve a lot of problems. Um, it, it's, it's a remarkable program. Again, it's a lot of work, but it's, it's worth it. So that's a couple of slides here. Um, you, you know, uh, Ryan asked me to share a couple of tips and I think these are um, gonna be obvious for you, but um, surprising how often they're missed. But missions diverge, you know, if it's agency to agency, do you have policy conflict? How will you work around it? Um, strengths and weaknesses, your partner should complement your strengths, you know, focus on finding different skill sets than your own. Um, Long-term goals, are, there, are they similar and compatible? You, know, you might disagree about how to get there, but you should share the same overall vision, whether it's with whatever kind of partner. Um, you know, can you achieve your goals by working together? What are they? Um, what are your roles before you even start? You know, who's responsible for what? So you're not overlapping and causing confusion. Um, and your roles may change over time. Um, how do you communicate? How often? Um, is it working for both of you or all five of you or 10 of you? Um, you know, you want to set a reoccurring time and date so you can timely address these issues. You know, don't let a year go by um, before you talk about anything. Um, again, seems obvious to put things in writing, but um, so often people don't. Um, but it, it'll help to find your, um, your needs and um, be as transparent as policy and law allows you to be. Again, it's simple, um, but email mishaps happen often. Tone and intention are important to know. Just call someone. Um, defining problems. Uh, not everything is a big problem. Um, consider this when you're negotiating your agreements. Um, check in with employees um, and partners. There's a lot of you know, money and, and livelihoods often involved in this kind of recreation business. Um, the politics can be very stressful. So, you know, keep an eye on the stress in, in these situations um, with your employees um, and your partners. Um, for me, the bottom line is there's just, again, there's no way we could possibly get all of our work done as required by law and policy without all of these partners. Um, Definitely the special uses and outfitters and guides, but all of the other partners as well. Um, they, too, they take a lot of time and care, but the benefits in my mind far exceed the time dedicated to this, these processes. Um, and they do allow for constant communication with the local public, which is critical for preventing and solving problems. So um, having so many partners and having so many agreements allows us to be in constant communication, um, which is really important to us and it's really important to me. So um, thank you very much. I look forward to hearing everybody else. Thank you so much, and uh, particularly I think for those very useful practical tips from someone who has experience in the field in dealing with partnerships, both with government entities and with uh, private sector partners. Uh, so now we're going to turn to our Brazilian panelists, starting off with, uh, with Fernando Pieroni. Uh, Fernando, the Samea Institute, which you lead, has studied experience from the USA and other countries to help Brazilian federal, state, local, and government and private reserve managers adopt best practices in public-private partnerships to promote expanded use of and appreciation for Brazilian parks and reserves. 
Having listened to Ben and Ann's presentations, what aspects of that long US experience has been mentioned, 100 years uh, of, uh, of the Forest Service and also the Park Service and many state governments working with private sector partners. What, what do you think can be learned from that US experience, uh, particularly what, what, what are the lessons that Brazil can take home and apply as it moves to increase public use and increase the use of partnerships in Brazilian protected areas at all levels of government and in private reserves? All right. Okay, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to those of you listening to us. It's an honor to be here in this meeting. First of all, I want to greet Ben and Anne Sibele for sharing this space with me. Well, to compare Brazil and the US and the lessons learned, there are so many similarities, so many differences that I have to make choices of what I should highlight. Well, first of all, for those of you who don't know the Brazilian system, when we talk about conservation units in Brazil, we're talking about 12 categories which have their own roles. And one of these categories is the one so-called a park, which is more prone to conservation and public use. So when we talk about public use, visitation, recreation, we are focusing not that other categories will not allow other types of experiences, but concessions in Brazil have advanced in this conservation unit called park. When we talk about conservation units in Brazil, we talk about urban parks that also includes urban parks. It includes a difference, a context that I would like to make. The second one has to do with over a 20 years experience of which 17 years have been in concessions and natural parks in Brazil, which have been concentrated in four major parks managed by the Brazilian government. So what we have seen along the last three years, especially is quite a growth in this agenda it used to be four parks in Brazil. Now we have natural parks, urban parks, parks managed by the federal government, state parks, municipal parks. So we have quite a growth in this agenda. And today, what we see is that many governments are engaged in partnership programs. And nowadays, SEMEA works with several governments trying to foster these partnerships. We're now mapping over 60 Brazilian parks, which are mapped in process of partnership programs for public use. So what Ben mentioned, what you guys in the United States call for-profit partnerships as well as not-for-profit partnerships. Here in Brazil, there's a peculiarity, which is a specific legislation. So we have a team of partnerships that we call concessions, which is for-profit with businesses. Then we have partnerships with companies that don't have a profit, actually, but they do have a PPP, public-private partnership. And then we have partnerships with entities, which we call the third sector, which would be cooperation agreements that Anne mentioned. And then we have permissions, authorizations. Each one of these formats have their own rules. So we have a difficulty in developing these partnerships, how we have these models to coexist and how they fit within a legal framework that is as fragmented. What was mentioned here as to have the legal framework, a management plan, all the rules as per the environment, we have all these legal instruments and and infralegal instruments, they're all above the partnership contract. So in any case, you have all endeavor preparation of a legal arena on top of which concessions and partnerships occur. I believe this is one of the similarities 
that I can't make this connection, but what I would like to call the attention about the differences that I see in Brazil. If we see the contract of Iguazu, Sibeli can talk about that, she will talk after. So we follow the model of the US, the specific services managed by specific concessionaires. And with time, we realize that the parks that do not have a consolidated visitation, they have difficulties to apply this model because I'm not going to give a concession of hotel, food, beverages if I don't have a trail, if I don't have environmental education, if I don't have signs, if I don't have those issues that according to the maturity of the American institution and also the visitation culture of the US, I mean, this, it's not the same experience here. So sometimes we have a specific concession that is done in this permit modality that it's not successful because you have the surroundings when the visitor comes to the park, he or she would like to have this full experience. So we do have this need of coordinating several services. And the recent concessions in Brazil now is working with the integrated model with one contract includes all services, transportation, specific services, specific infrastructure, ticketing, parking lot, the whole user experience regarding the park and is provided the services by only one entity. It doesn't mean that there's no connection with the surroundings because now we are having integrated contracts. So what we can see that we're gaining scale and we can make some progress in terms of public policies. And Ben also mentioned that, and Anne also mentioned that this partnership with the community, with the gateway community generating opportunities. And the recent contracts, we have seen incentives and obligations for the development of productive chains or promoting environmental education, supporting research, conservation, Maybe I'm gonna give you a spoiler, but maybe Sibeli will talk about the renewal of Iguazu's contract because it's the oldest one in the terms that is more mature and thinking about visitation as a tool to promote development, not only the experience of public use and visitation and recreation, since we're making progress, we have seen that removing this idea, for instance, because now we have the Friends Association and has this relation with the concessionaire and all of that living together in harmony. But here in Brazil, we have seen this dichotomy for instance, if, if I have one modality, then it means that I will not have the other ones. And I can give you the example of Chapada dos Viadeiros, a park that had a concession recently where we have an excellent relation with the association of the guides, with the concessionaire, with the public manager, and we do have Quilombola communities as well. And they receive also the benefits of visitation in other words, we're making progress in this regard. We are not in the same degree of maturity of the United States, but we are following this path, having different models together and thinking about partnerships as tools aside from promoting visitation can also have policies of development of the communities and having the experience of urban parks Recently, the city of Sao Paulo established a concession of its main park, which is a, the center of the city and other parks that were 
in other areas were not attractive for private partners. And we don't have this model in other places in Brazil for private parks, but in those 60 parks that we have followed that are in this process of modeling, we have seen this idea being tested. I believe that in a short term, aside from having this integrated service in this contract with the park, but one contract with more than one park in the sense of promoting this type of subsidy and thinking systemically the impact of those concessions for the park system. One idea that we could not implement here in Brazil is the idea of having this communication among the parks, not in the contract, but at least through an account. The benefit, the surplus of a partnership could be channeled to a different park, not necessarily in the same contract, but in the fund. But we do have a lot of legal restrictions that we need to overcome in order to have this tool available. But we are making progress, nevertheless, in this direction. And I have two minutes left. I would like to highlight two points that were mentioned. When we are making progress in partnerships in Brazil, and we have this perspective of continuing in a faster pace, the managing agencies, they need to be ready to know how to manage those contracts. We had a mess in the past when we had a concession. The public manager will take care about biodiversity and will no longer have problems with his attention, but that's not true. Just changes the role now managing the contracts and needs to be ready. It needs to have training, support, and a team to provide the proper management of the contracts. Another point that I'd like to highlight is that having this perspective, having several partnerships being offered by the governments and by the managing agencies, nowadays the buy side of Brazil, in other words, the quantity of entities with I mean, for profit and not for profit that can be partners of the government is small. So we see this mismatch about having partnerships, but the capacity of the private partners to absorb those partnerships at the same time is a challenge, but an opportunity for new business. Those that would like to see the Brazilian reality. And the last point, and mention also transparency, dialogue, having all documented. I've seen here in Brazil a progress in this regard in the design of partnership contracts, adopting the best practices of concessions and partnerships of other sectors. For instance, having a risk matrix trying to predict the risks and share the risk between public and private, having clear rules in order to balance the contract, in order to resolve issues that may come in the future. I, I have seen the Brazilian contracts, they are improving in this way, and this will bring an important benefit in this relation, public and private, but also the experience of the user and also using those contracts as a tool for local development and regional development and also supporting conservation. I try to give you an overview, making a comparison. I'm here available for the Q&A and thank you very much for the opportunity and having this compared experience with my colleagues from the US. Thank you so much, Fernando. And I would ask you to please, in the chat room, put the uh, internet site for Samea. For those of you that may not know, Samea does a wonderful series of webinars just like this one uh, with individuals from different levels of government and the private sector talking about their important work to promote public-private partnerships and increased use and appreciation for protected areas by the Brazilian public. So thanks again, uh, 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 Fernando. Now we're going to turn to Sibeli. And Sibeli, as a manager of one of the most visited uh, parks uh, in, in Brazil, 
Could you please let us know how the overall policy framework that we heard Ben explain and then Anne talk about its application in a specific uh, protected area in the United States, how does that compare to how you use public-private partnerships at Iguazu National Park? And Fernando already mentioned just a bit about this, about the fact that you have a long history of concessions and you're modernizing your, your account. So what types of partnerships do you use at Iguazu? What lessons have you learned and how might this be changing in the future? Thank you very much, Jim. It's an honor to be here with Fernando and Ben, and thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to go back to what Fernando mentioned and also thinking about the interventions of Ben and Anne and the differences that we have regarding our reality. It's clear to me that what is important as well is the park culture that we're starting to develop here in Brazil. And we still need a lot to do when we compare to the US. So there's a lot to be done in this regard. And the number of partnerships that we have in the conservation units of the United States we can see that with the participation of the society, the society wants to participate as well in terms of the management of the area, regardless of the model and the interest of the entrepreneurs to develop new businesses. And answering to the question, I believe that the challenge that we have here in Iguazu is the possibility of enhancing the different partnerships that we have. And I'm talking about the partnerships for visitation and public use or recreation. And I can comment about the partnerships for other areas like Anne mentioned, for environmental education, for research. But in terms of public use, yes, we have had a model here of small concessions, lots of contracts. And in 98, we migrated to this model that Fernando mentioned, which is more integrated. I mean, in other case, we have four contracts here in Iguazu for the development for more activities and services in a more aggregated way. And this given the need of having players interested in this business connected to nature. To give you an example, recently we opened a bid for operators in a place far away from the area where we have the falls, Iguazu Falls. So it's not our main attraction place, but it's a place with a lot of potential. But we had just two companies that were interested in investing in this area. So other issues that we try to develop when we do not use this mechanism in block, sometimes it's not possible. So just answering to what Fernando was mentioning about the strategy for the future in order to try to develop and also to open the interest for the development of other businesses and other areas, we are increasing even more what I called a block in other ways to incubate, if you will, some businesses to foster other activities in areas that are more distant. So not the model that Fernando was mentioned of having a big concession 
in order to make feasible other units, but we are having a concession to make feasible businesses because the entrepreneurs, they haven't had much interest. And when I'm saying that they haven't had much interest, it doesn't mean that we do not have some companies approaching us, but we have provided some authorizations or permits to small businesses, direct authorizations, other modalities. But in the end, it seems that those tools, they are not strong enough. Something happens and I cannot give you a clear analysis with data, but businesses that do not flourish, maybe because the infrastructure and going back to this park culture that is starting maybe because the local infrastructure does not provide support to other activities. Our surroundings here, we have agriculture, rural municipalities, and for the meantime, they haven't realized this potential. They do not have an infrastructure for this type of activity. And those other partnerships, they do not flourish because of the deficiency that we have. And I'm talking about in terms of Iguazu, this is the second park in Brazil in terms of visitation. I believe that in other areas are even more difficult to have new developments in those areas without having more support. And now mentioning a little bit the interventions of Ben and Anne, and I just loved, I really loved your tips for this relation with the concessionaires because I, absolutely agree with all of them. And I have insisted that the partnerships, and here we discuss a lot, we have been discussing a lot concessions, but in fact, we need to have other options, other implementation tools, but all of them, they have the same dynamic so you need to let go the power. I mean, you need to believe in your partner and you need to understand that your partner is there to provide a service together and a result as well to our client, if you will, to our final user, the visitor, and they deserve to have a good service provided and it was very interesting this mechanism that you mentioned of local partners with the intermediation with the permits as well and also having this possibility of providing a wide range of services and having a lot of partnerships. And it was an amazing mechanism. But for that, we need to learn with this rationale. In other words, we need to incorporate that spirit of partnerships. I believe that this relation, it's very important. That's And in terms of the future, what I would like to mention is also Fernando, during his opening remarks, he talked about that, the inclusion of the partnerships of this big contracts, but with actions also for the conservation of nature is the, par the partnership with the private entity for the development 
for activities such as research, environmental education, the control of exotic species, and the resolution of the current problems with the fauna, and having also other roles. And we do have a lot of expectation to grow in this regard. That's it. Thank you so much, Sibeli. And this last comment you made, it's very important for our US uh, and other international observers to note that Isimi Bio manages a protected area system that's as large as that managed by the US federal agencies, but it does it with 2000 staff. And the US Park Service and US Forest Service and US Fish and Wildlife Service have between them about 30 times as many people uh, to manage a relatively similar size number of units and, and protected areas. So that very obviously in Brazil, you're asking for more, you need more support from partners because you have about an order of magnitude less staff to manage a similar size and complexity of protected area system. So that is one of the biggest differences. So now we're going to turn to Lorena Brewster and Lorena has been moderating the question and answer session. And we're going to ask Lorena in our last few minutes to present several of the best burning questions from our audience uh, to our, our speakers. Lorena, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Hello, you guys. Good afternoon. I am Lorena with the Forest Service in the United States. We are partners with the USAID, the US Agency for International Development. And we work in Brazil for a long time in this area of public use, and we have been developing lots of works regarding concessions. So we don't have much time left. The chat is filled with questions. So I'm gonna, first of all, ask Ben and Anne, do you it's a question it's an interesting question regarding specific examples if you could give us examples regarding innovation activities within the forest service as a whole this is a question to ben and also to Anne, more specifically to forest can you give us an example like a specific a concrete example of innovations that you have seen Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think on the on the business side, so the per people that have the concession contract, I think we've seen a lot of innovation around on the services that they're providing. So um, a lot of people want to, you know, rent trailers or um, stay in cabins or do mass participation events. You know, where three thousand people show up and want to go on a a bike ride together. Um, and so that's been something that they've been sort of pushing forward and promoting. Um, I think on our side, at least sort of like a policy example is we've really been taking a hard look at the way we issue permits, uh, particularly for how long. So trying to lengthen the amount of time that we give concessions to conduct business. So instead of being five years, perhaps it's 15, 20, 25 years. And that's in an effort to incentivize investment in our infrastructure. And You know, I would say that the innovation is more around here is is more based on logistics and, and them working with each other. And I and I'm not sure that really fits the word of innovation. Um, but these folks can turn on a dime. Hopefully that translates. Um, you know, if we close a huge area because of timber blowdown or fires they can just immediately react and change their plans so quickly. Um, you know, one day they're competing against each other and the next day they're collaborating together um, because they know they'll both benefit. So, yeah, I don't know if I'm answering the question, but their innovation really comes from um, communication and relationships. Yes, thank you. And don't leave. There's another question for you from Paulo Primo. He's asking, operationally wise, 
who manages the concession inside the national forest? Is it a staff with the USFS or how does this work every day? Quite a long question, isn't it? Wow. Um, so we have people dedicated to um, special uses and, you know, uh, administering the permits for the outfitters and the guides um, and the resorts um, and the cooperators. So we have people dedicated to that, but not very many. Um, so a lot of us will help out where we can. We have wilderness rangers that will um, help with compliance of those permits. We have recreation technicians outside wilderness that are in the campgrounds um, that, you know, monitor those folks and how they're administering the, the concessions there. Um, yeah, we all just kind of pull together and do it. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. In regards to the operational area, this is a question for Ben. Within the National Forest System, is there like a manual, a guide, an actual paper, like a booklet or something for planning and managing the concessions? And if you guys have it, can you share it with us? Yeah, so there definitely is. Um, like many things, there are informal guides and there are official guides. Um, informal just being tools that, you know, best practices. And then we do have formal uh, policy. So we can um, dig the link up and share that. Thank you, Ben. Many of the questions are with the Forest Service team. So I'm gonna ask one by Leonardo Bocchipani. He's with ECMBO, ICMBO. He's asking, within the work that we do with the concessionaires, there's eventually conflict because they think that institutions are asking too many details in the contracts that they sign with them. It's like an array of details that sometimes hamper the actual concession flow. So he's had lots of conflicts with it as a manager. So his question is, to what extent a concessionaire may bring best practices that the agencies not even looking at and could buy in, to what extent can we have this partnership from the private to the public? Well, I can I can start off. Um, so I, I think with our permits, uh, we do have a lot of flexibility there. So we have standard language in all of our concession contracts, but they don't go into as much detail as the day-to-day -day operations of of the business. And so that's where those conversations can happen to bring in best practices from the industry uh, and how they wanna do business and, and how that aligns with forest service priorities. Well, very well. I know we're rushing with time. Like I said, the chat is busy, but uh, time presses. So, let me hand over to Jim. Thank you uh, very much, Lorena, uh, for uh, monitoring and uh, helping uh, facilitate the Q&A session. Uh, I just looked and we have uh, 12 questions that we did not have time to get to. We're going to try to get them to our uh, presenters and see if there's some way uh, we can get that information to you. One of them was whether or not there were handbooks or guidelines on concessions, for example. So we'll try to find one way or another to get answers back to those of you uh, that did answer, uh, ask questions and we were not able to get to them. But I do wanna thank you all for your great questions. So now ending up, uh, I wanna thank uh, Lorena for moderating that question and answer session. We'd like to bring the session to a close now. Special thanks to Ryan Fincham, Suleni Cotto, and Aaron Hicks for logistical support behind the scenes. Thank you to the US Forest Service 
international programs, particularly the Brazil program, uh, led by Michelle Zuid until recently, and now by Jaylene Vera, and by the USAID, uh, US Agency for International Development, and uh, their team in Brazil for their incredible financial uh, backstopping of our collaborative efforts. And uh, also, we'd like to thank our simultaneous interpreters. They always do a great job from Parlare for their excellent work. I'd like to thank our four panelists, uh, Sibele from uh, Isimibio, Fernando from uh, Instituto Semea, and uh, Ben and Ann from the US Forest Service uh, for their points of view on the situation regarding concessions at a national level and specific units in Brazil and in uh, uh, the United States. I think that you've all left us inspired and motivated to keep working uh, towards more equitable protected areas, more accessible protected areas to all types of people, and to keep us motivated uh, to keep looking for ways to expand partnerships uh, and make our protected areas more accessible, more inclusive, and more user-friendly. Thanks to all the participants I see from the United States and Brazil and other countries, from uh, federal agencies, state agencies, universities, the private sector. Thank all of you for uh, listening in today. And uh, we hope you're walking away from today's session inspired to act, as we know the only way we can effectively manage and protect our natural areas is if it's a common cause. And it's shared not only by federal agencies or state or local government agencies and NGOs, by, by large and diverse segments of society, including the private sector. So we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. We will have more in this series uh, in coming months. And uh, thank you again to all of our panelists, to the Forest Service, to USAID, to my CSU colleagues, and to all of those listening in today uh, for participating in this great opportunity to share experience from the United States and Brazil regarding public-private partnerships to promote greater and better public use of our cherished natural areas. Thank you again. And goodbye.